Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, as we have said, my name is Grzegorz Świk. Nobody calls me Grzegorz anyway, so I'm Greg. Okay, so, but yes, this strange combination of consonants is actually my first and last name. Uh, is the wire long enough? I guess, yes. Okay. Uh, so, as it was also announced, I am here to tell you a little bit about dynamical systems. And uh, it turns out that very few people know what dynamical systems are, so if you never heard of it, don't worry. And it turned out that even some of the speakers never heard of it. It's a area of mathematics, an area of mathematics. And yes, my next slide highlights it. So what are dynamical systems? So maybe some of you have seen pictures like that. And don't worry about it too much. It's honestly, and as the title says, it's just a nice slide to talk in front because I'll be standing here and saying a lot of things and I wanted some background, so that's the slide. But in case you wonder what it is, so it's a fractal. Probably some of you heard in the term fractal, right? So this is a fractal. I believe it's a Julia set of some mapping. We might get into it or not, let's see. So by the end of the day today, you might know what this thing is. But what it really is, it's a beautiful, colorful picture. It has some house I mentioned and other properties, but I think the beauty is the most appealing part of it. Anyhow, so, and it's gone. Uh, anyhow, does it mean this is on? Nope, it's just gone. Anyhow, I, I, it's, I can also speak in front of a black screen, no problem. So, dynamical systems, a little bit background what it is. Dynamical systems have been invented in the previous century and the circumstances are very romantic. So, uh, the way dynamical systems were invented is the following. Uh, His Royal Majesty, King Oscar II of Sweden, uh, one day, yep, Okay, I'm fine with that. Um, and that's even better. Anyhow, uh, so Oscar II of Sweden, uh, one night had a very bad dream. He thought that the Earth might collide with the sun. And he was very worried. And he called for his royal mathematicians to prove that this was not going to happen. And they couldn't. And they couldn't because, well, we all know the laws of motion and physics and everything, right? You know, there's equations of planets, already Newton knew that. There's a little problem with those. The problem with those is we can solve those equations for two bodies. We cannot solve it for more. So if, there's, if there was only Earth and the Sun and no external forces, aliens, comets and other unpleasant things that can happen in space, Sweden would be safe. But with more planets and interactions between them, we don't know if the orbit of the Earth is really an ellipse, or maybe it's a spiral spiraling down onto the Sun, or not. And it's worried His Royal Majesty a lot, and he funded a huge, huge prize for actually proving that it was not going to happen within the next thousand years, I believe. So, the prize was very large, and lots of talented mathematicians applied for it. Um, some of them applied, uh, among them Penleve, but it was deemed insufficient by the Royal Committee. Uh, finally, the prize was won by a certain mathematician, and it was not just a mathematician, but one of the greatest ever, Henri Poincaré from France. So he published a paper, I'm not even trying to say it in French, uh, uh, the title of the paper was New Methods of Celestial Mechanics, and this is considered the beginning of dynamical systems. So essentially, it was about a study of a complex system in which some motion occurs, uh, which is too difficult to be solved explicitly, it's just impossible to be solved by classical methods. So this is more or less what the dynamical systems are all about. Uh, and little thing about this, I'm not sure if it's entirely true, but uh, the legend says that after Poincaré got this prize, and the prize was huge, he spent all those money to try to buy back all the copies of his papers in which his solution was presented, because there was a little gap and he just couldn't stand the flaw in his line of argument. And there was a significant gap there, so... Well, but it was such a brilliant paper that it well deserved the, the prize. I mean, he invented the, the new area of mathematics there. But he couldn't deal with one little subtlety. He just overlooked this little subtlety. And we'll get there. So I'll show you the subtlety that was 
so hidden that even Poincaré missed it at first. Okay, so I think I've done enough talking in front of the priority picture and let me get to the specifics. Let me straighten it up too. Yep, okay. Can we switch to the whiteboard? Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, here we are, and dynamical system deals with the following situation. Let's take some space. This is a space, and we have a mapping going from this space into itself. And that's pretty much it. That's what we're going to talk about all day today. Yes, right, it seems simple. So uh, let me clarify things a little bit. So what is S? Essentially, S can be anything, it, can be a, it is a set. Uh, but usually we want some structure on the set. So, like a topological space. If you, if you don't know what a topological space is, don't worry about it, it's not essential. Essentially, you know, you, you have to know, you know the, if you have a bag of apples, you don't have any structure, there's just a bag of apples, right? You don't have distances, per se, and so on. So in this sense, you would have to measure some things. Uh, if, 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 if it's still too abstract, just think about it, it's a rectangle or an interval or just a piece of a plane, whatever. We don't care about it that much. And f is a function. So I guess everybody's familiar with the notion of a function here, right? Okay. So now there will be a disclaimer. If you don't understand something, shout out. I love questions and essentially I really prefer somebody knowing something after this lecture instead of nobody knowing, not knowing anything. It's just, and so don't hesitate. There are no stupid questions. Even if you think that everybody else knows, maybe somebody doesn't, so. Ask questions, stop me. And also if I'm asking a question, don't be shy. You know, if I ask if everybody knows what is, and you don't, even if you're one person in the room, raise your hand. I'll try to do it quickly then, so everybody's kind of up to speed. All right, so that was the disclaimer. Coming back to my beautiful picture, that's, an, uh, that's a dynamical system. And if you don't see any connection between this and His Royal Majesty and the m motions of planets and so on, don't worry, I wouldn't either. We'll get there. So this thing is a dynamical system, and to be more specific, it's so-called discrete dynamics. Why is it discrete? Because there's a map. So Poincaré dealt with a different situation, but we'll talk about it for now. So we have the map, we have the set, and what we're interested in, we're tr interested in, in the following situation. We take some point, I insist, yes, thank you. And we take some point in the space, and this point is x. And now we apply map f to x, and x becomes f of x. Then we apply f to f of x. So we apply the map again. Then we apply the map again. OK, it's greenish. And now to make notation just a little less awkward because it's becoming difficult to read. This is denoted f2 and this is denoted f3. So the power at the function in dynamical systems means the, how many times it's composed with itself. So generally, f to power n is equal f composed with f, composed with f, composed, composed with f, n times. It's just like a power, but instead of multiplication, it's, it's, it's a composition. And what it means, we have point x, and it gets mapped to something, and then it gets mapped to something, and it gets mapped to something, and so on. We just keep applying the map, and we look at subsequent images of a point. Is it clear so far? Good. Um, so, uh, I'll just uh, I'll go over many examples of dynamical systems, of course, uh, in the nearby future. But for now, this this is the picture, and a little bit of terminology. So this thing is called a trajectory. So if you take a point, it's image and the image and the image and so on and all the images, it's called a trajectory. Does it make sense, right? You know, it's like you have a fly flying object. Dynamical systems are a lot about the terminology, so we'll spend some time getting you familiar with it. 
And now you can ask me, okay, but so what? So what are we interested in here? And the answer is dynamical systems are interested in a limit behavior of a typical trajectory. And there are two things here. First of all, it's limit. So limit, I guess everybody's familiar with, right? It's like a limit in calculus sense. Although it might be more complicated because limit in calculus either doesn't exist or it's one number. Well, it can be infinity, right? We can say it converges or diverges if you want to be more pedantic to, to, to infinity. In dynamical system, it's way more complicated and getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, I'll say, uh, what we converge to here is called an attractor. You might have heard the term, this term. If not, you'll hear it today a lot. Um, a typical trajectory is a little more subtle thing. What does it mean, typical trajectory? And essentially, it's up to us to define what does it mean, typical. What does it mean, we essentially don't care about some trajectories. So we can say we don't care about finite number of trajectories. That's the most trivial situation. Or we can not care about measure zero set of trajectories, whatever it means. If you don't know the word measure again, don't worry about it. It's essentially volume. All right. So this is what dynamical systems are about. And to give you the simplest example of a trajectory, let's see if I can do this. Not quite. Okay. I just have to be less flamboyant about it. Okay, good. So the simplest example I can give you. We have a set S. It was a rectangle, now it's more blobby. We have a point, and imagine that f of x equals x. It can happen, right? What would be the, what would be the trajectory of x then? It's always x, right? f gets mapped to x, and then x gets mapped to x again and again and again, and that's the trajectory. The point just stays where it was. Not very interesting or very interesting. Actually, we love it when it happens in dynamical systems. And we love it so much that we gave it our special name. It's called fixed point. Now, lots of people, of course, try to correct it, and they say, well, wait, well, what happened with ED, with fixed point? No, in dynamical systems, we are very idiosyncratic. And just think about the name, right? Have you ever heard the word dynamical? Ain't such word. It's an invented word, right? Batman and Robin are dynamic duo, not dynamical duo. Now, I was working with a friend at IBM before joining DeepMind, and some people referred to us as dynamical duo as a joke, but well, I liked it. Anyhow, so dynamical systems are full of idiosyncrasies, and in particular, we don't say fixed point, we say fixed point. So it's a point that's not moving. OK. Um, the second interesting situation we might like is this. So imagine you have a point, and now it is moving very much. This is point x. Let me call it x prime because it was, you know what? Let me call it y, actually. So this one was x. x is not moving. We have y and we have z here. So now we have f of y equals z. And imagine the following. It can happen. f of z equals y. OK, so now trajectory is also simple, right? y goes to z, z equals to y, and ad infinitum. And this is another simple situation of uh, in dynamical systems, and this thing we call the periodic orbit. So if we have a point that keeps going around, but then it hits itself after x iteration, n iterations, it doesn't have to be two, we call it a periodic point. And if you really think about it, it's not that much different from a fixed point because it's a fixed point of the nth iteration of the function. So this just means, in this particular case, it means f second power of y equals y. So whatever we know about fixed points, and we'll talk about fixed points a lot, we can apply to the situation with, uh, with periodic points. So two very important notions, the dynamical system, fixed point, and a periodic point. And I guess we have, I think, to be good to do some example now, because I'm being very abstract so far. So let's, let's have an exa example of a map. Before I go to examples of a map, is there anybody in the room who is not, um, a bit not familiar with complex numbers? Everybody familiar with complex numbers? Good. Very, <laughs> very happy. Very happy. Okay. 
So now that I stated it, there will be nothing about complex numbers for a bit, but I just wanted to make sure that we switch. Anyhow, okay, let's consider the following mapping. By the way, does, it, does everybody know the symbol I'm using with, a, with an arrow at the, with the bar at the beginning? So supposedly in some countries it's not used. In Poland, it, it just means mapping. This means there is some map and X is mapped to, to X. Okay, so this is a, a map. And to be more specific, let it be a, on the set of real numbers. So real number, every real number is multiplied by two. How am I doing on time? Good. Um, what are the properties of this map? Does any, is anything obvious about this map? It has a fixed point, right? A zero. Zero maps to zero. So we have a fixed point, it's nice. Now, what's the rest of the dynamics? The rest of the dynamics is the following. The positive numbers multiplied by two become larger and larger. The negative numbers get multiplied by two and get smaller and smaller. And this is a really trivial dynamics. We can essentially say what the trajectory is and because the trajectory xn, and by the way, the subscript now means the nth image of x. So x0 is x and xn is, is nth, nth number will be two to power n times x. So now we have an explicit formula, and it's very much the opposite of what I was talking about that Poincaré dealt with. We had situations which couldn't express the things, and usually, and here's the whole deal, you do not have an explicit, uh, explicit formula for the, uh, for, the, for the nth element in the trajectory. So, in this case, the dynamics is the following. There is a fixed point at zero. Everything then escapes to plus or minus infinity, or, if you like the compactification, and mathematicians love compactifications, if you imagine it as a circle, you can say that infinity is another fixed point and everything is just, you know, pushed away from zero and goes to infinity from one side to another. And now, in terms of uh, dynamical systems terminology, this is a repeller and this is an attractor. So it's spelled with O and not E, it's repeller. That's how we call it in dynamical systems. And also, uh, we, we also could say that the infinity is attracting, not attractive. People say attractive, but that's not the right term in dynamical systems. It's attracting, pull things together. It's like a black hole. Okay, so it's a very simple dynamics. And obviously we don't study things like that. So let's do something a little bit more complicated. Something a little bit more complicated would be the following. Let's take a plane now. Or a rectangle. And actually, I should even make it a square. Well, I can make it a rectangle too, but then my argument will not be as elegant as if it was. Okay, so let's all agree that this object I drew on screen is a square. Good enough for me. Okay, and now the map will be a translation by a vector. But if we just define map like this, it's not a well-defined map because if we just apply this vector a couple of times, we're out. I guess everybody figured out what do we do. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a square, it's a torus. Does it, everybody know what a torus is? Okay, good, I can explain something. Torus is a pretzel, or a tire of a car. Torus is this. Like, exactly the tire that you have in your, unless you have tireless car, which probably most people do, but you know what a tire is, right? You know that they used to have them, or a tire, you know, of a bike. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, a snake that's eating its own tail. Okay, so it's a very interesting object. Uh, again, something that Poincaré overlooked. No, Euler, I'm sorry, not Poincaré. Euler overlooked when he was defining his characteristics, but let me skip that. Um, so, how can we create a torus? We can create a torus by identifying this side with this side. We glue them together. So we got a pipe, and now we identify this one with this one. So now we put it together and we have a torus. 
an interesting thing happens if you do the otherwise. You can identify different differently. So a little exercise. What happens if we identify like this? And we can also do like this. And any combination thereof. This is a nice one. It's Klein bottle. Anyhow, but we're not talking about Klein bottles and other things. We're talking about a torus. So we have a mapping of a torus, which essentially means if you played the old video games, the same thing. You know, if, if the, an asteroid was flying off the screen, it was coming back on the other side. So essentially, your screen was a torus. And torus is also a very important thing. Otherwise, if you if you if you even if you don't care about theoretical math, torus is very important in distributed computing. So very often, if you have a distributed computer uh, computer system, the things, the nodes are connected in a torus configuration. So of course, physically, it's just a bunch of circuits and plenty of wires in the room. But topologically, the configuration of your nodes is often a torus. The, the things are connected in such a way that you know the distance is more or less, in a way, uniform. I'm digressing. Okay, coming back to my example, we're coming out on this side. And we are coming on this side, so the mapping would be x, y, um, yeah, x, y goes to x plus a Uh, I usually will be, will be writing vectors vertically, but for now I wrote it horizontally. Uh, is anybody, uh, fam is everybody familiar with mod? Okay. Uh, it's modulo. So this is an operator. You have it in computers, right? It's like, uh, but what it means, uh, a modulo B, and those are different A's and B's. Um, it means this. A modulo B is A if A is smaller than B. If it's larger, we subtract B, and we just keep repeating. So we have a for loop, and you just keep subtracting B until this thing is smaller than B. You never go into negatives. So essentially, modulo means that if this is B and A is outside, you just keep cutting it until it comes back. So modulo means you return back. It's a very, uh, very useful operation. I believe the symbol is percent. I don't remember. Every language has it. Has it it's percent, right, in Python? I always forget those things. <laughs> Anyhow, OK. So uh, this map makes sense, right? If you go outside, if any of the coordinates is larger than one, we clip it by one. We subtract one. So this map is a little bit more interesting than the previous ones. It's a very classical map. And believe it or not, plenty of, uh, of examples come from this map. So this map, sometimes people call it Anasov shift, but I couldn't find it uh, when I was Googling today. So I'll, I'll just stick to the name. It's called a torus shift. So this map is called a shift on a torus. And by the way, in case you wondered how this word I was saying is spelled, it's this torus, T-O-R-U-S. And you know what? I'll actually honor the great man, or Anasov shift. Anasov clearly deserves honor and recognition. So what are the properties of this map? Does anybody know what's going to happen? OK, so it turns out that this map has very different behaviors depending on one little thing depending on the ratio A over B, whether it's rational or not. And that's why I needed a square. I needed equal sides, so everything is modulo 1, and I don't have to worry about things like that. So essentially, what turns out? Now, let me give you a very simple example. If, the, if A was equal to B, we would just be moving along the diagonal. We would go back, and we would be moving along the same line all the time. And depending on the length, we might be just moving along the same line all the time, hit, hitting its point, or just staying on the same line. But the trajectory would be contained in one line. Is it obvious? The thing is, if this thing is irrational, let me even do a, a different example. It might be that for other configurations, 
you might get two lines that wrap together. Again, this is something that you have to imagine for yourself. So if it's not clear right now, believe me. Or it can happen that your line goes like this, like this, like this, three times in the square and so on. This would happen if this number is rational. If the number is irrational, you never hit back. You keep winding along the torus and you get something dense in the torus. So it has a very nice name in Russian, obmotka. It doesn't have equivalent in other language, so a lot of people just say obmotka. It's a Russian word. It's winding of a torus, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's called winding of a torus, but I like obmotka better. So depending very much on a little subtlety, either your tra trajectory essentially sweeps across the whole torus and in the limit, you get the whole torus. You'll get something dense in a torus. Or it can be a very thin set. It can be just a th thin line on a torus. So either you have this torus and you just have you know, this little winding on it that winds back. Imagine you put a string on a torus. Or you get something that never hits its tail. You have this infinite snake that never bites its tail and just keeps winding and winding and winding and keeps going on and on and on forever. So I think it's an interesting map. So that's another example of the dynamical system. <laughs> and as you might have observed, so far, all those examples were linear. I was only talking about linear mappings, either multiplying by two or adding constants. And it already gives us something interesting. So, um, um, so these were the, the linear mappings, linear examples. Let, let's go nonlinear. And here, uh, complex numbers come into play. Now we're in C. Any questions? What is this? This is C, complex numbers. Really? You don't, you don't use this symbol? It's, it's complex numbers. It's like, you know, real numbers, complex numbers. And I think I ran out of resources. Yeah, that's that's all I know. <laughs> yeah, I see it's complex numbers. Excuse me, I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, what is wrong with, so go back to the previous example. Okay, what's wrong with me, okay. What is wrong with a rectangle? Uh, you skipped it and then you said it's not as elegant, but what is wrong with it? Oh, uh, you, I would have, then I would have to deal with the ratio of the size of a rectangle. If the rectangle has sides, uh, one and square root of two, then the angle, which is irrational, would give me a, 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 a not, not a winding. Right? I'm, if the ratio is different, I'm stretching the torus, and now that uh, the snake might bite its own tail. It's the same thing. I just wanted to, you know, fix the, the frame of reference and Occam's razor. Okay, complex numbers, and the mapping will be that's a lovely map. Love it. Okay. So what does this map do? Any obvious properties? Fixed points, anybody? Z zero, right? Yes, thank you very much. We have two obvious fixed points. Zero, one, fixed points. Perfect. What else? Any obvious properties? Unit circle, anything about it? Unit circle is invariant. So, let me draw a picture. Zero is a fixed point, one is a fixed point, and every point on a unit circle stays on a unit circle. Because what does the second power in complex numbers do? We use the Moivre formula. Uh, absolute value of z goes to absolute value of z squared and phi goes to 2 phi in the angular coordinates, right? So the circle is an invariant set. This is a very important notion in dynamical systems, invariant sets. What we try to do, so if we can, sometimes we, if we have a dynamics, we could split the dynamics into pieces. We couldn't do in the previous examples. The previous examples were actually ergodic, and it's nice. This one is different. Here we have three distinct regions of dynamics. And you can argue even there's four because there's a fixed point, but okay, let's, let's not get idiosyncratic there. So essentially, what's the dynamics inside the disk? 
everything is spiraling down onto zero. Everything goes down to zero because the absolute value of the complex number under the iterations of the map will go down and down and down and down. It will fall onto zero. The circle stays where it is. Everything outside will wind out to infinity. So we have three regions of dynamics. We have the separating regime on a unit circle. And what is interesting about it? So we call those things basins of attraction. That's the, another term, basin of attraction. Zero inside of the disk without the boundary is a basin of attraction of, uh, of, uh, of, of a zero. And everything outside of the disk of the, of the disk is a basin of attraction of infinity. Then, I already used this word and I warned you, I will repeat it a lot. Zero is an attractor. It's a trivial attractor, it's a one-point attractor. But it's attracting inside of the disk. Good. So that's, that's the example with uh, z-square. Uh, and you might remember the colorful pretty picture that was behind me. So apparently, the picture that was behind me and was so colorful and lovely is an analog of this thing, but only the map in that case was z, was going to z squared plus c. And for certain c's, the analog, where the things are breaking up, there's still a, a division between the basin of attraction of zero and the, the basin of attraction of infinity, and uh, this set, in the trivial case of c equal to zero, is, um, is a circle, and if c is non-zero, it sometimes gets nice and, you know, sophisticated and that was the colorful picture. And it's called Julia set. And it's historically how fractals were discovered actually. Well, with a little caveat. I'll tell you about it in a second. Anyhow, so this is the mapping. The only thing now that remains to be investigated is, um, uh, is, the, uh, is the dynamics on the unit circle. So what's the dynamics on the unit circle? The dynamics on the unit circle is, this is a fixed point, and it has plenty of pre-images. There are plenty of points that fall into it. Pre-image of a point It's a very useful notion. Pre-image of a point is the set of all points that get mapped to this point. Uh, mind you, sometimes x is not in the pre-image. X is a not, a, not a fixed point, it, uh, it's, it's not in its pre-image. So pre-image is very important. We'll be using it a lot. So minus one and one are in a pre-image of one, right? If you take a second power of minus one, okay, we can keep, keep iterating. What are the pre-images of minus one? I and minus I. So the pre if we go back with pre-images of one, we get more and more points and we get a dense set that gets uh, sucked into one. So we have a dense set that just gets pulled in and as you see, if you go with pre-images backwards, you can get something bigger and bigger. Sometimes it's called a backwards trajectory. And it's not a trajectory per se because you don't have uniqueness. You don't have uniqueness because the mapping is not one-to-one. -one. It glues things together. Z-square glues things together. It winds things down twice. Nevertheless, for all other points, well not for all other points, but points with irrational angle, because what's the mapping? The mapping is, in terms of angle, phi goes to 2 phi, and mod, sorry. So to be more specific, the mapping would be phi goes to 2 phi modulo 2 pi. If the angle is larger than 2 pi, we subtract 2 pi. So it's the same th situation like with the torus, and if phi is irrational, if you keep multiplying it by two, you'll never hit zero or two pi, no matter how many times you do the modulo. So all the, most orbits will be dense. So it's a very interesting mapping. You have a dense set of pre-images of one, and you have a dense, uh, and, but almost every point, because obviously almost every instance of, of continuum uh, cardinality 
is, uh, is, is filling everything. So almost every point has a dense trajectory forwards. Was there a question? It seemed to me. No? Okay. So that's, uh, that's this mapping. That's another example. And I think we got somewhat familiar with, uh, uh, with, uh, with what dynamical systems are now. This is, these are examples of discrete dynamics. Okay, so now that everybody is comfortable, let me switch gears and s complicate things. So this was the discrete dynamics, now we go to continuous dynamics. Dynamics. Okay. Um, Back in focus. Okay, so uh, what in this situation, and this is what Poincaré dealt with. So if you didn't see a connection, there wasn't. There will be one made in a moment. Essentially, continuous dynamics is connected with differential equations. And now a very serious question. Is anybody, and I mean anybody in the room who doesn't know what a differential equation is? Okay, one person. Good. Good enough for me. I'll tell you very quickly what the... Okay, so differential equation is an equation of the sort. That's a differential equation. Uh, misconception. Uh, uh, differential equation is not uh, just any equation that involves uh, derivatives. It has to be something like this. Okay, so this looks simple, but this is one of the most important things in, uh, in, in mathematics, generally in the universe, I would say. So before I... Oh, okay, go for it. Was, was it my writing that moved it? Okay. Okay. So a little thing that mm, um, symbols for derivative. Okay. So the symbols. Um, it's actually funny, you know. We've been doing calculus for I don't know hundreds of years, and we still haven't fi haven't figured out the proper notation for derivatives. And it would be surprised how many papers are terribly, terribly, terribly struggling with a problem that there's just not a good notation for derivative. And sometimes, I if you go into recurrent neural networks, it's a nightmare because you just run out of slots in your in your notation, and there's plenty of complication, and it's just just because not, not, not a proper symbol is being used. So, the symbols I'm going to use, I can write like this. And to be even more specific, then x will be x of t. So x is a function of t, and this is a, the derivative with respect to t. Another way I can write is that, and I can write this also. So essentially, a very good rule is, if you don't know what you're differentiating with, with respect to, you write it explicitly. This is always dx over dt. Dot is always differentiation with respect to t. And the prime means either you want to confuse your reader, which is also a very you know beneficial thing. But uh, the proper use is if you know what you're differentiating with respect with. So I'll be using this symbol a lot. So if somebody is not... Uh, not familiar with it. It's just as a prime that you're probably used to, but it emphasizes that my free variable is t. And another reason I like to use it is that that's a symbol of Sir Isaac Newton and, no, oh, he was Newton. So, um, we're, we'll be dealing with a situation x dot equals f of x t. And this is continuous dynamics. So what does it mean in terms of intuition? Well, we have certain vector field. We have certain vector fields, so we have our set S, and now it's called phase space. And we have set of vectors there. Uh, 
So I always think about it as like, you know, as a mathematical hedgehog. We have, we have this set covered with vectors or a pr procurepine. Um, and what we're trying to do, we try to fit curves that at each point are tangents to those vectors. So in another way, way, we're saying we have set of velocities and we try to find a movement inside the space which fits those velocities. And again, the solutions of differential equations are called trajectories, so the terminology persists. And as we all know, uh, the universe is, the physics is run by differential equations. Okay, so um, this is another way to look at problems. And you might start to see, uh, see connections with, uh, uh, with, uh, with machine learning, I hope. Great innocent, right? If we have a neural network, that was the big breakthrough, right? What really is deep learning? Deep learning was figuring out that if we have composite systems of functions of a certain class, so it's a combination of linear functions and then followed by some nonlinearities, and that if we introduce the proper error function, and if we train this thing by minimizing the loss by gradient descent, it actually does nice things. But what's a gradient descent? Gradient descent is essentially following a gradient flow. It's following the vector field defined by a gradient of a function. And right there you have smooth dynamics. The next thing you know, you discretize it. You discretize it because now you have a learning rate. So what you do, you replace continuous dynamics by some approximation. And in terms of mathematics, in case you're familiar, using gradient descent that we do in machine learning is nothing else but using Euler's method to solve differential equations. We just take a finite step and we take some learning rate, and that's pretty much what we have there. So right now, already I, I showed you some connections between those two settings, and in a way this thing we had on a torus was an example of, uh, of, of a discrete dynamics that could have been in theory coming from some machine learning problem. We just keep adding our gradient, which is constant. It would never train because that's the nature of the thing. It would be just winding along the torus, but essentially that's what would happen. Okay. So this is introduction to to uh, to, to differential equations. Well, showing the showing the connection. How was Poincaré seeing this the connection? So Poincaré invented something. Well, Poincaré invented literally hundreds of useful things. But one of the great things that Poincaré invented was the following thing. So what was the pr uh, problem that he was dealing with? Remember, His Royal Majesty King Oscar II, Earth colliding or not colliding with the Sun. So, you have the following system. You have a center that's your Sun. This little dot, let me make it bigger. Now, Newton's laws or Kepler's laws tell us the trajectories of motion of a body in a central field are ellipses. Good and fine. But this is in the absence of other planets. So now the trajectories are ellipses. The question is, if there is a perturbation from another planet, they perturb, they are no longer ellipses, and the question is, do they perturb but more or less connect where they started? So, are the perturbed trajectories Maybe a little wiggly, exaggerated, of course, but do they connect or not? Or do those darn things do this? Do they, do they connect to still set of ellipses or do they connect to a spiral winding down? Second, well, so probably they all connect is, is not a good thing. It's, it's, well, it's, it would be a lovely thing, but it's not feasible and it's unstable, but if, and that's what Poincaré did in his paper, if we can prove that there is one guy that connects, we're good, because it's a barrier, no pasaran, you cannot go through it. It's called limit cycle. But as you can see, it's a pretty complicated thing, and we cannot solve differential equations for, uh, for three and more body problems. They just don't exist in our set of functions. Here's a little distinction, however, which I would like to emphasize. So we all know 
that we cannot compute the roots of polynomials of degrees uh, higher than, uh, than four. We can do it for four, for higher than five, there's the, the theorem of galois abel Ruffini that we cannot compute those roots. Don't get confused, those roots exist. We just don't have symbols for them. And here's the same thing, sometimes we say, this function is not integrable, like e to x squared, right? You cannot compute the integral of e to x squared. It doesn't not mean that this function is not integrable. What it means is, in our set of functions, we just cannot express it by a formula. It's not in the list of the functions that we know. So we don't know its properties. And the same thing here. Differential equations do have solutions. There's a theorem that every differential equation has a solution, moreover, a unique solution. But we don't have a formula for it. So we know it exists, but we don't know the properties. And essentially, the idea of Poincaré was the following. OK, so what? We don't know the, the formula. But even if we have a formula, you might remember from calculus. If you have a function and you want to study its properties, what you do, you differentiate it immediately. You compute the derivative and you look for properties. And here we already have a derivative. So why do we care? We know the derivative. What can we do with the derivative not knowing the formula? That was the genius observation by Poincaré. And what he introduced there was a thing called Poincaré section. So let me simplify this picture a little bit because there's been a lot going on in this picture. And let me go white again. So Poincaré said this, this, this thing. Imagine we have a point and we have some trajectory coming out of it. And we don't really know what this trajectory is. But we know that roughly it comes back to the vicinity. What he introduced was a thing called the Poincaré section. Well, probably he didn't call it this because he was a very modest man. He just waited for the others to do the job for him. Sometimes the, the, the mathematicians actually give a little hint. So when Banach introduced Banach spaces and gave a first talk on it, he called them B spaces. Just <laughs> if, you're, if you're Banach, you can do it. If you're not, I don't advise. You might get a lot of vitriolic comments. I've heard this happen. If some, somebody was referring to M spaces and it didn't land that well. So. But in Banach's cases, it did. Anyhow, so this is the Poincaré section. And what Poincaré did, he said, let's look at the map from this section. So what we do, how do we define the map? We take a point, we go along the trajectory until the first intersection to the same section. So what we call this, it's a first return map. And now what we have, we have a mapping, and let me go green again. I insist. Thank you. We have a mapping that goes from this interval into itself by means of the trajectories. Is it clear how the map is defined? Again, maybe, just to make sure. We have this line. If we have point on this line, what we do? We go along the trajectory of this point until it hits back the same line. And that's the image. So we now have a proper mapping from a section to a section. If it's one dimensional section, it will be a mapping from a straight line to a straight line. If it's more dimensional, fine. Of course, you can ask me, and what if there is no intersection? Then the map is undefined. So, now in terms of this map, uh, Poincare was able to rephrase the problem posed by His Royal Majesty by saying, is a zero an attractor of this map or not? Or do we stay away? And in particular, this limiting trajectory here, what would it be? It would be a fixed point of the map. So obviously there's a contradiction. Now the white thing couldn't go across. So what Poincaré was looking, he was looking for the fixed points of the displacement map or the return map on the segment. And that's your connection to one dimensional dynamics right there. That's what, that's what he cared about. OK, we'll not be studying Poincaré maps. And of, of course, you can ask me, OK, that's all good and fine. But how on earth do you know this map without knowing the formula? You know, how can you find this map without, uh, uh, without uh, knowing the formula for the trajectories? Is it like you know, rephrasing the problem, pushing it away? It turns out that the properties of this map can be studied because then it can compute its derivative itself. How? By using implicit function theorem. You're just using a calculus, you have a trajectory. so. Sometimes you can do something about this map. And there's a really heavy machinery there in place, which I will not, talking, uh, not be talking about. Actually, my PhD thesis was a little bit about those, those things. So there is a heavy machinery, and sometimes it's very difficult. 
but the point is you can do it sometimes. All right, so this is a connection between the discrete dynamics and the um, and differential equations. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit again and maybe talk a little bit of a philosophy of dynamical system for a second and then present you with some very solid results. Okay, so. Mm. The title of my talk is Dynamical Systems for Machine Learning. And I came up with this statement. I said it once and it turned out to be very controversial and I love being controversial so now I'm saying it every time I have the opportunity and I'm getting a controversy and it's just self-perpetuating mechanism. So the statement is, uh, when people come, to, people come to me sometimes and they're asking me, is there a theorem in dynamical systems that would, and then I interrupt and say, and say back, there are no theorems in dynamical systems. And I'm going to contradict, contradict myself in a moment, this is another thing that I love doing, and I'll present you with a couple of theorems in dynamical systems. Nevertheless, I believe the statement, as provocative as it is, it is true. Dynamical systems are a very strange area of mathematics in which there are no theorems like in most other areas. So, Think about probability, right? You have central limit theorem, and it's essentially a huge hammer. It destroys many of things, it's like a general purpose heavy tool. Dynamical systems have theorems more like an algebraic geometry, if you're fam uh, familiar with Null-Stellensatz, for example. There are foundational theorems that essentially tell us, okay, what we talk about makes sense, but if you try to apply those theorems to practical problems, you might find that they're somewhat orthogonal. This being said, I'm going to present you with two theorems. There are two foundational theorems in dynamical systems. And the first one of them is a theorem of Grobman Hartmann. And I need a different color. So I deliberately decided to not make a slide about it. Um, because, you know, if you really want the formulation, Google it. It's, uh, you can read it and there are some technical details there and nobody will remember it anyway. So there are some assumptions about smoothness and whatnot. I'll, I'll tell you what this thing is. So this thing tells you the following thing. Assume you have a fixed point. So we have X and such that X maps to X. and the dynamics is uh, defined by f. At some point, I'll probably stop using f and start using phi, so bear with me, but for now it's f. So we have our mapping and we have a fixed point. Now assume, let's look at derivative of f. Okay, you know I introduced three symbols for a derivative and I'm using the fourth. That's what we are, the mathematicians. Look at the derivative f, and even more so, at x. So the value of derivative at that point x. I said something about the notation. So what's a derivative of f? Usually, and let's say, let, let's agree that the, that the spaces are n. So I, I said before this that our space can be anything, but for now it's dynamics in our n. The ma this thing is then a matrix. Let's look at the, va at, at the eigenvalues. If all the eigenvalues if all the eigenvalues are not equal to one, then, and now I'm mixing a definition with a theorem, but that's okay because it's a talk, I'm not writing a paper or a book. This point is then called a hyperbolic point. Then, this theorem says that the dynamics in some neighborhood of, of this point is the same as the dynamics of just the linear part. So, because what does this thing say? It says that f of x equals to x plus 
and to be actually let me even make it better. F of x plus h equals to f of x, which happens to be x, plus d f of x evaluated on h plus higher order terms. That's a Taylor expansion. And you see why I use this symbol with x here. That's what I talked about the notation. Derivative has plenty of slots. And if you're not careful and you're doing RNN and you don't use this notation, you're headed for a disaster. And so are your readers. The, the Grobman-Hartman theorem states that then, in terms of dynamics, for h is small enough, you can ignore that part. You can just get rid of three dots. Your linear approximation of dynamics is your dynamics. Does it make sense? Okay, so it's a very foundational theorem, and this completely sets a course for everything we'll be doing. So when I'm saying this thing, the provocative things, that there are no theorems in dynamical systems, what do I mean by it, and I believe it, and I was very happy that some prominent dynamical systems experts like Mike Shoup agreed with me on this, or Curtis McMillan. Dynamical systems is more methodology of approaching new problems. You're not trying to pull out a rabbit out of your head. You pull out a very general tool and start building a new thing. So dynamical systems is like a philosophy. It tells you how a framework to approach problems. And this gives you the framework. So if you have a dynamical system, the first thing you do is look for the fixed points. That's your skeleton. That's your scaffolding. Then you look for the dynamics around those points, and you see how it looks on the micro scale. And then you do the thing that children do, at least I did when I was a child, connect the dots. You have plenty of dots, and you see how things flow, flow from one to another, and you hope to get the full picture. It often works. OK, so that's a Grobman-Hartman theorem, which essentially says, if your eigenvalues, and I should have asked, is anybody familiar with the notion of an eigenvalue? Okay, so if your eigenvalues are not one, then, uh, then it's fine to linearize. This is, if you really think about it, uh, the generalization of the fundamental fact from calculus. If your derivative is greater than zero, your function is increasing locally. If your derivative is smaller than zero, your function is decreasing. If it's zero, you don't know. And here's the thing, if your eigenvalue is one, it essentially means there is no motion generated by the linear mapping. If you multiply something by one, it stays the same thing. So everything from the linear point of view, if all your eigenvalues were one, every point would be a fixed point. And then the second order motion dominates it. Grobman theor theorem says, if there is observable li linear motion, locally it dominates everything that's nonlinear. So it's a very expected result. And that's why I didn't give you a proper formulation. I'll go back and give you a little bit more proper formulation when I introduce one more notion. Okay, so that's Grobman theorem. That's the one foundational theorem. Another one is called Andamar Perron. Okay, what does uh, Adam Perron theorem says? Adam Perron theorem is a wonderful theorem because it has been already rediscovered like at least 20 times. Uh, my friend who are reviewers in, in many dynamical systems journals say that every couple of years some people submit this result, like a breakthrough result, because it's a very difficult proof actually. What does it say? It says the following thing. Let's say again we have a hyperbolic point. Then, and unfortunately I can only draw in two dimensions, so we have a hyperbolic point. And we have, this means we have some lambdas, which are smaller than one, and then we have lambdas that are greater than one. The theorem says that through this point, to this fixed point, there will be going through manifolds, two manifolds. One is stable, so there will be a manifold with such a dimensionality There will be a manifold of dimensionality u, where u is the number 
and I should call it S, I'm sorry. It will become evident in a second why I switch the letters. Let the number of eigenvalues whose absolute value is smaller than one be S. Then there exists a manifold going through the fixed point with the dimension S such that this manifold is invariant and there is a contraction along this manifold. Everything is shrinking. And there is a manifold of dimension U, which is the number of eigenvalues, which are larger than one, and it is looking like that. There is, uh, 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 there is a repelling along this manifold. So obviously S and U comes from stable and stable. This is called, yes? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, imagine a surface in, in, in RN, like a piece of a sphere, bented uh, piece of tin foil, surface of a bubble, a surface in many dimensions, something that's homogeneous but curvy. That's the intuition. The, the, the proper definition is terrible. Something that's locally a disk. So something that you, if you look at it, think about the torus. If you cut out a little piece of a torus and if it was made out of the rubber, you can, uh, you can just flatten it. So manifold is just a patchwork of little things that each of them can be flattened if they were made of, out of rubber into, into, in, into flat patches. But then you can create complex shapes and it can be many, many dimensional. Does it make sense? So in particular, those lines I draw are manifolds, one dimensional manifolds. They can be split into segments. They're just, yes. But in a big picture, this is a manifold too. It's a, it, it was supposed to be a circle, but my drawing is terrible. That's a circle. Okay. Um, so we have stable and unstable manifold. That manifold is stable. That manifold is unstable. Okay, so that's Adamar Perron theorem. It says that they exist and that they are of certain class of smoothness and so on. So this theorem comes from Adamar Perron, but Poincaré already knew it. He knew it in his paper when he was doing the thing for, for, for the king of Sweden. He discovered this, this thing, but well, he was Poincaré, so he did a lot of great things. Okay, so those are two theorems essentially on which the whole dynamical system stand. Because now those objects, those objects are really, really fundamental for constructing a bigger picture. And we're gone. I still, th I have like 20 minutes, yes? Which is great because I'll be able to tell you about homoclinic connections and oh, so, so <laughs> shameless act of sabotage. Now what really I'm curious about is uh, are, are my pictures coming back or have we lost all that I was writing? <laughs> Here's the date, okay, yes, good. Mm -hmm. Can I use it now? Okay, good. And it's gone, okay. We'll be fine, don't worry about it. I know all this stuff, you see, I was, I remember all this, anyhow. Okay, so we had Grobman, Hartman, and Adamar Perron theorems. Uh, so all of that might happen, it will ruin some dramaturgy when I wanted to you know, sweep back and see, voila, and I will have to redraw it, but that's the only problem. Anyhow, so now I would like to tell you about something really fantastic, in my opinion. So what, what's something fantastic from my perspective? Imagine you have a point, and I think we're in two dimensions for now. It's marvelous, but a lot of things can be done in two dimensions in dynamical systems. And we have a nice hyperbolic point, meaning two eigenvalues, and even more so, one is larger than one, one is smaller than one. So this point has a stable manifold, an unstable manifold. But the thing is, those manifolds extend. They don't finish anywhere, they, they just extend to infinity, so they have to do something. What can they do? Well, they could just go to infinity. We'll, we'll show you an example. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because I probably should have talked about saddles and things like that, but I'll go, I'll go with my plan now. 
So imagine this is a stable manifold. This is an unstable manifold. And now something happens far, far away. And you can imagine that those two things intersect. Because why not? They can. There's no reason for them not to intersect. They're just two manifolds. They can intersect. This thing is called a homoclinic connection. Uh, intersection, I'm sorry. It's a homoclinic intersection. A connection would be if they were going one to another. Because what could happen would be this. They could be connected. One could be both stable and unstable, just showing two faces. But we're not talking about connection now. We'll be talking about connections later on, or not, depending on time. This thing that I drew is called heteroclinic, homoclinic, sorry. Heteroclinic, it would be if they were coming from two different points. Homoclinic, because they come from the same point. Homoclinic. Intersection. No, why? Okay, so this is homoclinic intersection. Now, what's happening next? Well, this manifold is repelling, this manifold is attracting along this direction. So this point will be coming towards our fixed point because it's on this stable manifold. So it will get mapped to something here. Meaning, there will be something like this. There's still a piece of the unstable manifold right next to it. Then, it will get mapped again and again. This keeps happening. So far, so good, but what's happening now? There's a barrier. You cannot jump to the other side. Ain't happening. So what's going to happen? Now in this direction we have attraction, but in this direction, in the unstable direction, we have stretching. So this thing now will do this. We've got spread all over itself. This precise uh, the behavior is described by something called lambda lemma. which so tells you exactly how much, to what extent, things get flattened, stretched, and so on. If somebody in is interested in qualities, go there. <laughs> but what is really happening here is something marvelous. And in case you wonder what was the thing that Poincaré overlooked in his paper, this is exactly the thing that Poincaré overlooked, that there is a terrible complication happening here. He kind of said, oh, if those things happen, things might get messy, but I think it's okay. No, it's not. It's not, and what's happening, Think about a little rectangle here. You know what, actually, let me make it even colorful rect rectangle. Think about a little rectangle around the, uh, the unstable manifold, or to even, let me even draw a better rec rectangle, and I'll make it purple, like this. Well, you know what, let me st stay with the green. Actually, green one is good. Anyhow. What it does, it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going as we iterate, as we iterate the map forward. This green rectangle keeps wandering al along the manifold. We're moving forward with dynamics and so on and so forth. And then it comes back stretched like this because this thing keeps folding, meandering. What does it mean? If you are lucky, if you, if you choose the, or unlucky, and unfortunately lambda lemma tells you to always can choose it in an unlucky way, you'll get something that's really nasty. You'll get this rectangle, which is coming back in such a form. It maps onto itself it's returning along the trajectory, but it gets folded twice because of this winding emo motion, and it's placed on itself like that. And now we can just look at this map. And this map is crazy nasty because the next time we're coming back, we just look at this map, we keep repeating it. What happens is this thing will get twice, and it keeps repeating 
and you're starting to get checkerboards of things, and the dynamics inside is crazy complicated and starts depending on very subtle things, essentially, your limit behaviors is determined by wild attractors called counter, multidimensional counter sets, and this whole thing has a name, and it's called Smale's Horseshoe. And why is it called Smale Horseshoe? Well, uh, Stephen Smale is a uh, Fields Medalist. He got his Fields Medal for solving Poincaré conjecture, I believe, for dimension four and five. So he was a very prominent guy in uh, mathematics. He's also, uh, his other contribution is popularizing the Fields Medal. Does everybody know what the Fields Medal is? It's like a Nobel Prize. Okay, so. Um, there is a Nobel Prize, but there's no Nobel Prize for mathematics. And the reason for this is that uh, Nobel very much disliked certain mathematician by the name of Gustav Mita Leffler. Sweden again. Sweden was very, like, has a huge bearing on mathematics. So Nobel hated Gustav Mita Leffler for some reasons, and there's no Nobel Prize for mathematics. So there is a Fields Medal for mathematics. However, so that's the official story. Um, the real story is Fields Medal for many years was a very obscure little prize that nobody knew about and most of the Fields Medalists, they were really well chosen. So this prize was well placed, great people got it. John Milner, Alfors, Smale. Uh, however, it got uh, became a mathematical Nobel Prize for extremely funny reason in my opinion. Namely, it was in the uh, when Stephen Smale got his Fields Medal, uh, it was uh, given. Uh, it was given in Moscow, and Stephen Smale was a hippie. So uh, some uh, people were accusing him of, uh, you know, going to Moscow for wrong reasons. And to counter it, New York Times uh, said um, Stephen Smale gets mathematical Nobel Prize. And the stuck and Fields Medal became very important. So Stephen Smale popularized Fields Medal and got uh, and got his um, got his prize. And well, then uh, then switched over to dynamical systems. So he's one of the founding fathers of Smale's horseshoe. Supposedly, this horseshoe was invented when he was very high. Actually, that's the legend that he called uh, Mike Shoup, telling him that he observed this thing. Anyhow, so this is an example of really bad things that can happen in dynamical systems and tells you what those manifolds are for and so on and so forth. And I was told that I'll have to be wrapping up. Uh, so uh, in the last couple of minutes, what I would like to really focus on is a very important notion, which I didn't talk about and it's fundamental for dynamical systems, it's conjugacy. Okay, so what's conjugacy? We say maps F and G are conjugate If if there exists phi such that, and there are many ways to write it. I prefer to write it like this. if such a quality holds. <laughs> Alternative way of writing it would be the following. Does it look familiar? It's a typical operation in mathematics. It's the same thing you do when you, uh, you, change the you choose a different basis for uh, for linear operator, right? if you do Jordan canonical. So, what it really means 
it means that the systems are the same. We just look at them in the wrong way. So philosophically, it uh, Occam's razor, right? You know Occam's razor. It's a philosophical principle. It's a lovely principle. I love it. So if there's one takeaway from today, learn. Uh, I'll tell you Occam's razor. Might be very useful in everything. So. Um, the funny thing is that the guy who invented it was not even named Occam. It's called Occam's Razor, but actually it was a nickname. People called him the Razor of Occam because he was coming from a place called Occam. And he was so sharp in his arguments that he was called a Razor. But he essentially had this philosophical principle that's formulated in many ways. And sometimes people say it, keep it simple. But the way he formulated, if we know anything about it, he was a medieval philosopher. I believe he was medieval. Uh, he was saying, don't multiply entities beyond necessity. And his fam favorite example was, imagine you're sitting in a field and you see a road far away, and there's a knight on a horse on the road, he's riding. And then you take a nap, and you wake up sometime later, and you still see a knight on the road in a different place. Those are not two knights, it's the same knight. Yes, it is possible that the previous knight went into the woods and some other knight came out of the woods and now on the road, but that's just stupid. Unless you have a really good reason to think it's a different knight, assume it's the same knight. And the same thing here. We're m F and G is multiplying entities beyond necessity. Those are the same thing, just from different perspectives. It's a perspective, right? You know, if I'm moving, I'm still seeing the same set of people. So. Conjugacy is nothing. I'm saying it because people often think that conjugacy is something mystical and, and magical. No, it's just a change of perspective, just like you do in the, uh, with the linear mappings. Am I out of time? Because, or, oh, so I still have five minutes. Good, yes, so I thought. Okay, good. Mm. B but here's a very important thing that I overlooked. Uh, the question is, what properties does the phi have to have? What function is it? And here's a big big question. Phi can be just a continuous mapping. Phi can be just an invertible mapping. So the least we, uh, we assume is that phi is a bijection, that it's invertible, one on one, one to one, and inver essentially invertible map. You don't glue things, and you don't rip things apart. Um, but usually, we like at least a homeomorphism, right? We want it continuous and backwards continuous. We, want to, we might want to have a, a, a differentiable conjugacy. And very often, a big research is, it is known that there's a topological conjugacy, so it means two maps are the same, you can stretch things in such a way that they look the same, but you introduce non-differentiabilities. And the question is about existence of a better conjugacy Conjugacy is not uniquely determined, are very often very difficult, and sometimes you know people spend years trying to prove that you can Im improve the Helder exponent in some conjugacy existence. So there's a whole big thing around it, and um, what I was about to say. Oh, uh, if you remember, and I here I wanted to make a dramatic sweep, but I won't because of the sabotage. Uh, you remember Grobman-Hartman uh, theorem, right? What it says formally is that a system in some neighborhood of a hyperbolic point is conjugate to its linear approximation. Topologically. That's a big thing. Topologically. So we only have continuous change of variables that gets rid of all the higher order terms. And unfortunately, sometimes you cannot do better. If you want con uh, differentiable, you end up with something called uh, normal forms theory, which and those forms can be very complicated. You might need to have some quadratic term there. And by the way, Poincaré already knew it. Poincaré introduced normal forms. The amount of things this guy did is like incredible. Anyhow, so now that I am almost out of time, I'm going to give you a homework. Well, it's not a homework because I'll be seeing you in three hours or so. And I'll be nasty and I won't say any keywords so we couldn't do a Google search. Well, if you're stubborn, you will. But consider the following map. Right hand side should be obvious into itself, endomorphism. We're in dynamical systems. Mm. 
bear with me. Yes, now I'm happy. Okay. So, this is a map, and it's a nonlinear map, and simply not an invertible map. So, I'll get a little bit ahead. Well, this is a part of the homework, draw a graph of this map, but I'm assuming you can draw a quadratic map. Let's see if I can do it. So, at least the way it was intended, this map has a value. Uh, no, I messed up. Give me a second. At. Uh, uh, okay, I cannot draw a power bar. Okay, let me fix it. Uh, Now it's good. Let me even draw a better picture now. Okay. The previous one is good too, but let, let me do it this way. Uh, okay. So I have zero and okay. Stays like that. So so how how does the map look like? The value at zero is zero. The value at one is zero. What's the value at one uh, one over two? Well, that's the design is that's why there's a four in front of it to make it one. So it's a parabola, and it goes all the way up to the top of the box. So even better, it's a parabola that looks like this. <sighs> so this is a map, and the homework or the question is. Can you find a conjugacy to something nicer, something simpler? Von Neumann could, so why shouldn't you? Okay, thank you very much. Questions, comments, remarks? Do you have any questions? Oh. Wow. So uh, go for it. So That's what I'm here for. So it looks like everybody understood everything then. <laughs> so Except for me. <laughs> so I have one question, actually. Go uh, for it. So you, you presented this Grobman-Hartman result. Yep. Um, but I think it only applies to hyperbolic points, as you presented. Yep. So now my question is, are there other results that characterize further, that subdivide the hyperbolic points further? So hyperbolic points are probably a big set, right? Can be any point that, uh, that what is it, what is the definition again? So derivative doesn't have uh, eigenvalue of one, right? And that's what you... Uh, obviously, we're humans, so whenever there is an exception to assumptions, we try to do, you know, there's some, you have to write your PhD thesis in something. So yes, there are plenty of theorems, but they are not nice. So essentially, there is a concept of a central manifold, uh, along which something called a bifurcation happens, and I might say a little bit about it in the second part of my talk. Mm -hmm. So yes, for non-hyperbolic points, there is a study of what's going on, and there's plenty of things you can do, and you can... Uh, you can borrow from algebraic geometry and you can do all kinds of singularity resolution and just try to make something that's nonlinear linear. You can do a normal form and try to reduce it, but there is no good theorem. That's exactly what I was talking about. You go one step beyond hyperbolic and instead of just having a theorem, you end up with case-by-case -case study and you have books of results that just cover pieces of the spectrum. Mm. So you know how to attack it. Mm. In part, if I give you an or if you give me an equation, mm -hmm. at least 10 years ago, I knew what to do about it. Um, but um, how to approach it, but I cannot just pull out a theorem out of my, uh, of my cylinder and say, hey, here's a theorem. That's how it is. Just right. have to do some work. Any, um, so any other? Uh, yeah. Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, could could you repeat what you said near the end when you said after after you explain uh, conjugacy you mentioned that it all tie back to the Grofman Hartman and uh, theorem and then you said that something map is the conjugate of linear something I, I didn't quite catch absolutely that. yes 
Grobman Hartman revisited. Take the map x goes to x plus df at x. Uh, this is this is your uh, this is your f. That's Tyler expansion of f. So this is well defined. I'll deliberately skip this. Now take a map. No dots, uh, not plus h, h times h. grobman hartmann theorem says that there exists phi homeomorphism such that which means that the dynamics are the same. And I think I should say one thing. Uh, this thing means, conjugacy means, and you can check it trivially, that the tra trajectories of F are mapped by trajectories of G by means of the, uh, of the map phi. I'll say a little bit about, about this uh, uh, after the break. But essentially, this means equivalence. Uh, the pictures look similar. It's just a stretching of the, of the picture. Because, you know, the thing is, if you keep iterating, very simple. If you just keep iterating g, oh g equals phi to minus one times f, not times, but composed with phi, composed with phi to minus one, composed with f, composed with phi. Just cancels out. That's the beauty of it. So, so conjugacy conjugates every power of f. So you have unique mapping between the two trajectories. That's why it's equivalence. And, it, and I can write this because it's a homeomorphism, it's invertible, so it makes sense to have phi to minus one. But I prefer this notation instead of the one with the invertible because you can do these things for non-invertible phi's, then it's called semi-conjugacy. Okay, but uh, what, what are f and g in this case? Uh, are they related to some machine learning concepts? Absolutely not. They can be anything. But they can. Uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, F and G, uh, uh, think about a very deep network and think it's uniform. It's a, a bit of a theoretical construct, but not exactly. It describes a lot of things. If you keep going with your signal through the layers, you're iterating. So F can be one pass through the layer. So it will F can be a combination of nonlinearities and linearities. Groban Hartman will tell you that G, you can skip nonlinearities locally. You can replace nonlinearities with its derivative, and usually you choose the nonlinearities in such a way that the derivative is one. Caveat for values, you're non-differentiable, so you have to be careful with this. You have to do a little bit more, so immediately you're stepping outside of your charted territory, but on the side on which you have derivative, you can apply it to some extent. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, can we, me? <laughs> so can we go back to the um, like step back to the concept a little bit? Um, just would like to understand what's the drive behind um, the study of dynamic systems in uh, machine learning. Like, what what was what was the problem that we we were trying to solve the first time that they start studying this? Um. It's a not very well posed question because dynamical systems existed like 100 years before uh, machine learning. Unless, of course, Gauss knew machine learning because it seems that Gauss knew everything that was invented after Gauss, if you look at his papers, including fast Fourier transform. But machine, uh, the dynamical systems, like I said, were invented by Poincaré in the 19th century and machine learning was kind of 60s it started. Uh, so they existed before. Now, the machine learning community is ver uh, very likes very much to look at previous results and try applying them. So what was the other way around? Machine learning people at some point started looking at dynamical systems. And the link is obvious because you have gradient descent, which is right dynamics in the space of your weights. So that's the link. Then there's another thing 
called RNNs, recurrent neural networks. Recurrent, you're iterating something. You have the same thing and you keep, keep feeding something back. So these are the connections. And th now there is a lot of interest in community and there are even you know, some special tracks on many conferences devoted to dynamical systems. Unfortunately, lots of those papers just show that the authors don't know what dynamical systems are and I would be very fine if they called it dynamic systems, which is something different and go with it. Um, so very often it's just trying to slap some terminology onto things that don't really need them, but sometimes there are good insights. So there are things that I'll be talking about the next time I just have to, had to you know, build some framework. Uh, there are things like stability, there's lapuna functions which people use a lot. Essentially, you know, if you have things like natural gradient, if you want to prove that your algorithm converges, uh, very often, my fir the first thing I did at DeepMind when I joined DeepMind was there was a paper that got rejected because the reviewer said that there's no way this thing could ever work on anything. And what I did, well, it, it works. Here's a proof of convergence. It does work, this algorithm does converge and the paper got accepted. So that's, that's the application. And I could go on like forever, but. Have any questions? It should be the last. Yeah, question. last question. Yeah. Uh, I have a very basic knowledge relating to topology yeah. math. Mm -hmm. uh, I might be uh, misunderstanding. Uh, I want to understand more. Uh, I mean, based on the machine learning concept. In machine learning, you know, we have to iterate. I, I mean, gradient to to have a to get a. Uh, uh, good performance or something like that. But in the core concept of the topology math, uh, how about the iteration? Uh, do you consider or do you have some kind of uh, limitation or concept on iteration? Let's say uh, in uh, topology cycle and the ellipse are the same, right? Uh, but uh, there are several, you know, uh, iteration in general. And then there can be a many shape in general. And are there any core concept? I, I, don't, I don't clearly understand uh, how about the iteration or the repeating the steps or something like that, yeah. You can repeat the steps on any set. You don't have to have any structure. I see. Uh, mm. Have you seen guys playing three cards? Pardon me? There's this game of three cards that people play in the markets uh. when they want to rip you off your mind. There's three, uh. there's three cups reversed uh -huh. and there's a ball underneath one of them and you can, you can iterate, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have any topology there even. It's a set. It's a set of three cups. Uh -huh. You can just uh -huh. be shifting them. So we can have dynamics on a discrete set without any any structure at all. Does it make sense to talk about it? It's a different thing. Uh, mm. Regarding mm. machine learning, I don't really think we need to talk about topology in machine learning. In machine learning, anything mm. is at least a manifold. Mm. Let's really think about it. It's, it's yeah, a ramp. Yeah, yeah. You can, well, in machine learning, sometimes you talk about Hilbert spaces, mm. but in my opinion, mm. it's a bit of an overkill. Uh, we talk about Hilbert spaces, but usually it's an RN, so it's, it's a slightly overblown terminology. But in theory, mm. yes, in, in, in kernel methods, people would look at, at, uh, at topological spaces. But generally, the bottom line is, if you don't know what topology is, don't worry, I just use this word and it just means mm. I am deforming things into one another in a smooth way in such a way that I'm not ripping things and I'm not gluing things together. So that's, that's all, I, all I really need from topology for mm -hmm. this talk. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of more freedom in I see. It's just <laughs> the language that I'm so used it's, it's to. I'm just used to say those things because that's the language in, in which I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so in the interest of time, if you have more questions, please come to ask Greg offline. Yes, thank you. Great.